we're going to have to deal with the fact that it may be harder, it will be harder for us to hire new employees. Any employee we hire as of tomorrow will have to be vaccinated before they come to work here. So it's going to be a little bit harder for us to recruit. What does that mean to you all? It means there's the possibility for a few months we're going to have some reduced services, or it's going to take a little bit longer to get you down, or um, an event might have to be postponed. We will keep people up to date if that's going to happen, but again, I think that the risk of that happening is worth the fact that we'll have 100% of our employees uh, vaccinated. We are going to allow a carve out for religion exemptions and health exemptions, but they're not an easy one to get. They're going to have to do their homework just as they would with any other uh, exemption for us. It's written up by our attorneys. It's a process. But there are people who truly can't take the vaccine. Um, those employees will be tested on a very regular basis so that we have that protection in place. Again, I think the biggest negative we have is we will see some employees leave. Talking to other CEOs and other COOs of life facilities, they saw 10 to 20% of their employees leave because of the vaccine mandate. So for us, you know, that could be 40 people. I don't think we're going to see that many people leave because we have a lot of people that have been here a long time. I think our employees did an amazing job during COVID of working hard and making sacrifices to keep this campus safe. And this is just that one more thing we have to ask of them. And I have to ask of them. And again, today we're, we're going to do that ask. But I'm hopeful that a lot of those people who a week ago and a month ago said they would have left if we mandated it are thinking differently because of what's in the news because of the great um, relief residents saw and staff members saw over the last six months because of the vaccine of not having to be as afraid of not having to stay locked in apartments of not being able to come down to dinner the vaccine allowed that and i think our employees saw that so again i'm hopeful we're not going to see 40 employees leave westminster village but if we do we're going to survive that and we're going to work through it and we're going to find other good fits Things you all can do, remind employees over the next 30 days especially how much you care about them, how much you appreciate the sacrifices they have made, and hopefully the sacrifice they are going to make by taking that vaccine, even if it's not what they want to do. Again, I think you have and our frontline supervisors have way more influence of getting those employees to take that vaccine and stay working here at Westminster Village than I do as a CEO by sending out a letter or talking to them. They keep their jobs here typically because they care about you all, because they love that environment, or because they trust and want to work for their frontline supervisors. So we're asking all that management team to work hard to convince those employees to work with their doctor to make sure they're comfortable taking the vaccine and then take it. We're also talking to them about Look out in the outside world before you just quit here and think there's another job down the street. Because you don't want to quit here as a nurse having been here for 20 years and then go to the hospitals and find out, oh, they mandate it. Or go to the retirement community down the street and find out they might not mandate it today, but they're probably going to mandate it within a few weeks, especially if they take Medicare patients. So I think we're going to continue to see those regulations change we're seeing things with OSHA, we're seeing things that are, where insurance companies are charging higher premiums, so more and more companies are going to move in this direction. So giving that information to our employees is important so that they, they understand that the, replacing the job they have here isn't as easy as they might think it will be. Uh, and again, we were doing that because we want to encourage people to stay here and continue to work here and continue to take you know, great care and pride in what they do. Uh, so again, what you all can do is continue to, to make sure they know you care about them. Residents did that over this COVID period. We had the highest amount of money raised for the employee holiday party last year with COVID. And again, I think that shows the employees you all care about them. The fact that employees gave donations to help when we're in the midst of COVID to make sure we still have good hot meals brought in for the employees. 
shows you care about the employees. The comic cards you put in every day, the amount, the birthday cards, all those things. Continue to make sure that's a priority. Make it hard for any one of our employees to go work somewhere else where they don't have to be vaccinated. The other thing you can do is, when we do hit that point where we might have slower service for delivery or less housekeeping or something like that, be, and this is, sounds funny, but it's on a bunch of restaurants, be nice to the staff that show up. Because when those people that do get the vaccine or already have gotten the vaccine, and they show up to work and it's short staff, and it's really hard to come in, they need to be treated nicely, even when things don't go perfectly. So continue to remember that a month from now, two months from now, three months from now. We will build our staff back up, but it's going to take some time. Be really nice to the ones that show up to work every day, even if they're not at their best. You know, it's, that's important. Uh, and it's one of those things that kind of goes without saying, but sometimes I think we need to be reminded of those things that go without saying because we forget them. Uh, so again, we will, as of today, be mandating the vaccine for all employees. Um, we're looking at what we can do with some of our vendor partners that are on campus a lot. Some of them have already said that they will do whatever we ask, and others um, were still asking and pushing for it. And others were looking for other partners to fit in that if they're not able to do so. Um, some people will probably take the vaccine immediately, and others will take all the way up into the last day. So we still have, and then again, it takes time for it to become effective. So we still have some risk on campus. And the reality is we always have risk on campus, but we're gonna reduce that risk even, even more over the next 30, 60, 90 days by making this mandate. So again, I, I think this is a popular mandate for most of our residents. It's gonna be unpopular for about half of our staff. Uh, but again, we hope to not see 20, 30, 40 people leave, but I think there's a chance that that happens. So, questions? Yes, Anna, it's coming with the microphone. Yeah, I'm concerned about <clears throat> people who come to provide services, like beauty services, therapy, um, even programs that are people come in to give. What about those people? So we, we can't have a mandate for visitors at this point under Arizona state law. Now, what we can do is we can restrict all visitors and we're gonna look at that. So depending on, just like happened before, depending on what happens with the COVID numbers in the valley, we, we may see a reduction in allowing visitors in. We probably won't see a reduction of allowing them in the hallways, but we may see a reduction of allowing them in the dining rooms or at activities. I'm more concerned about the people who work here on a regular basis to provide beauty services, therapy services. Are those people included in the mandate? So right now they're not because they're not our employees. So what we're looking at is like Morris and the food service company. They have said if we mandate it, they will mandate it. There are other companies that have said they're going to look into it because there's, there's legal costs of adding the mandate. More than likely, we will get sued by an employer or group of employees for making this mandate. More than likely, we will win that lawsuit. But it will cost us money, it will cost us time. And so some of the smaller companies may not be willing to take that risk. So if they're not willing to, then what we will end up doing is find another partner. But that may take time. In the meantime, if you want to go to the salon, and I don't know everybody's vaccination status at this just like if you want to go outside of campus, that's a risk you're going to have to decide if you take or don't take. So those other services, once again, with the mandate of our employees, there are still going to be some risks out there. And each individual's got to determine their own risk factor. So if you're uncomfortable with that, then my suggestion is, at that point, don't go to the salon until we can say the salon is a place that's 100% uh, vaccine mandated. 
And again, that will take a little bit of time for us to work through those other partners to figure out who are those. But the ones that are going to be in line with us will announce. The others, there will be some risk. And again, individuals have to make the determination if you're willing to take that risk. Um, at the employee entrance door, I think that's N1, we used to be taking the temperature each day of the employees as they arrived, but we're not now, and yet they're the ones bringing it in, and I'm wondering why we're not taking the temperatures. So, two things. Not every case that's come on campus has come in through an employee. Um, some of them have, and sometimes it's impossible to know. But we are doing the temperatures. The, the machine there is taking the temperature when an employee comes in. So every employee, when they're first time in for the day, has to register in with the machine, and then it takes the temperature. If their temperature is out of range, it pages a number of people who then will bring a nurse or a security guard in to take a manual temperature. So we are doing that again. Yep. Yes? I'm concerned about I'm concerned about visitors. I don't know what the procedure is now, but I had sent a note, a uh, comment card, um, saying that I wonder if you are asking visitors to show proof of vaccination. What is the procedure now? So we don't ask visitors for proof of vaccination, and in Arizona we're not able to ask visitors for proof of vaccination. What we do ask is a series of questions that are the same questions we ask employees and then we take the temperature. So we ask if they've had an exposure, we ask some of those other questions. And again, visitors are supposed to be wearing the masks in the common areas. And at some point, again, right now we don't want to reduce too far the services. And I'm hopeful that we won't see the counts in Arizona continue to climb. I hope they're somewhere where they need to be. Most of the experts say we won't see the top of this swell until October. So if we see counts go up to 5,000 a day or 6,000 a day or we see more cases on campus, we may reduce the, the movement of visitors on campus to reduce the risk to employees or to residents. Sorry. Um, and again, it's kind of weighing that risk reward balance. Visitors on campus is important. We don't want to have residents isolated in their apartments again. We want to keep that movement as long as it's safe. And again, the fact that almost all of our residents are vaccinated is, is, a, is a good sign. Again, my recommendation to you as residents is if you have a visitor, make sure that that visitor is safe and that you're bringing them into our, our building, into your homes. Don't have somebody who's doing crazy things. Make sure when you talk to them before they come that they are healthy. I can't tell you over the last 18 months how many visitors came in to visit mom, mostly, because mostly there's moms here, um, and they were sick and they knew they were sick. And they still came to the door and we caught it and had to send them back over and over and over. So talk to your visitors. Make sure they understand how important it is to you and your neighbors that they come when they're feeling healthy. And again, that if it's your kid or your friend, that they are vaccinated. Again, the vaccines have done wonders to make life on this campus fine again, make it like it was. And again, we need, we're gonna force that on the employees. You can peer pressure your, your visitors and your kids. We aren't able at this time to allow some in and some out in independent living, we can say there's no, no visitors allowed. It's not because they're not vaccinated. It's, it's all or nothing. And again, I just, we, we don't want to go there if we don't have to. For the new Westminster residents who have received the Pfizer vaccine and it's been recommended that a booster be the same, will those arrangements be made for the Pfizer to be here? So we won't have the ability to bring the Pfizer on campus, um, but we can help get arrangements to get you to where you can get the Pfizer. Because of the temperature control of the Pfizer, 
we just won't have enough. We won't, in order for us to buy the vaccine and have it here, we have to have 144 doses given. And Pfizer has to be given in a fairly short period of time. So we won't be able to do that. But we will be able to provide transportation to a place that will. Any other questions? Don't have to be on COVID. So, and then just quickly, an update on our, our residents. As of today, the resident cases we had, all those residents are considered recovered today, except for one. That one will be recovered on the second, and that one has had no um, symptoms. So, again, I, I think that shows, and I, if you ask the people who had the virus, it wasn't pleasant even with the vaccine. But again, the fact that our survival rate is what it is shows that vaccine has huge benefits even if you still get COVID. So again, when that booster shot comes out, my recommendation is talk to your doctor, but it's been an incredible, incredible uh, thing for our campus and our residents and our employees that have been vaccinated. So continue to to follow that advice. Uh, I'm asking about, we've often had the flu shot here. Yep. here, here. And I wonder with all the COVID, are we also going to have, uh, be able to get the flu shot here? When we, we are. So Lori's working on the flu, flu shot. And the timing of the two is you shouldn't take the two at the same time. So she's trying to work out the best way to do both of those. It'd be nice if you could just do them both at once, you want to do both, but it's not the recommended way, at least from what I understand at this point. And then the follow-up question that most people ask about that is, will we mandate the flu vaccine to our employees as well? And I can tell you, we don't know the answer to that yet. Any other questions? No? About anything? Are you going to talk about financials? So, am I going to talk about financials? I can talk about financials. Uh, I didn't bring a presentation because I figured we would spend the vast majority of time talking about COVID and the, the vaccine mandate. Uh, are there specific questions on the financials you want me to answer? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, can you please just uh, can you just give uh, uh, an overview of uh, what you were basically going to say in, in, the, in the future so that people will be aware of the direction that you are, how you're going? Yeah. I'll give a, a fairly generic overview because my goal today was to really talk in specifics about where Westminster Village is today in comparison to where we were 10 years ago and to where we think we'll be 10 years from now. And the overview of that is, and some of you have been around for a long time and you've probably heard Bud Hart say this, and I believe it's still true, is Westminster Village is in the best financial shape we've ever been. I'm happy to be the CEO of Westminster Village today as opposed to in 2008, as opposed to in 2000, or 1986. Westminster Village is in a strong financial position. Could we be in better shape? Absolutely. Do we wish we had more money? Absolutely. But we've worked hard to find a balance between those, what we used to call a three-legged stool, residents and their satisfaction and quality of life, employees, their satisfaction and quality of life, and the board, their satisfaction and our financial status as a company. 20 years ago, maybe not to the date, we had about $5 million in the bank. We had an older building. We had a negative fund balance of a, somewhere between 10 and $15 million. Today, we have $15 million in the bank. We still have that same negative fund balance, about $13 million. We have three empty apartments. We have happy residents, even through COVID. We have people who want to move in. Up until this vaccine mandate, we have pretty happy employees who want to be a part of our team. And again, we're going to work through that. 
I sleep pretty well. I don't worry about our financial status. Now, that doesn't mean we're not working to make it better. There are things we absolutely are doing, things we've been doing as part of our strategic plan from the board of directors for the last 10 years. But it's about that balance. If we want to just be a profitable organization and see that fund balance change, we can do that by charging all of you more. Because that's where all the revenue comes, for the most part. We can do that by paying our employees less or having less employees. But again, it's about creating that balance. Because if our residents are charged more and you run out of money, do we really do us a favor? If our residents are charged more every year, a 10% increase or more, whatever the inflation is going to be this year. And people don't move in because they're afraid that we're going to see 10% increases every year and they're never going to be able to afford to live here. Did we do us a favor of, of making those changes? We didn't. So we work hard to keep that balance. It's the same with the employees. Over the last seven years, we went from a minimum wage of our employees from about $8.50 an hour to $14.50 an hour. That costs more money. We've added services. We have more people in home health today than we did then. We have more people in activities than we did then. Those things cost money. But again, we're, our fund balance is about the same as it was 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Our cash balance has gone up, and the satisfaction and the level of service we provide has gone up, and we continue to have a list of people who want to move in. So, You've got to balance all of those things. If you look at one, in eight, one single item on our cash numbers or one single item on our uh, balance sheet, it can be deceiving. It's about balancing those three entities. The health of the organization, the board, the happiness and health of the residents, and the employees. Those are the three key pieces that come into play. And it's really easy to let that get out of balance. It's really hard to keep it in balance. Our previous CEO, I think, did a tremendous job of keeping that in balance. Our current board, our past boards, and hopefully our future boards will look at not just one bottom line item on anything. They'll take into consideration how important it is that residents feel they can afford to live here, future residents feel they can afford to live here, throughout the end of their life, that you all sitting in these rooms don't feel we're putting, and again, I know that 3.5% even feels like an undue burden. But when we can keep that consistent for three years and four years and five years, I think it causes a lot of people to breathe a little bit easier than if that goes from five to seven to three to 10. That's important, you know, balancing the budget on the backs of residents or on the backs of the staff is not the right thing for us to do as an organization. It's to slowly make changes. Several years ago, we started pushing towards mostly life care contracts. Because in the long run, that's going to help us with the accrual-based financials. That doesn't help us immediately. It helps us immediately with cash. But on the accrual-based financials, on the bottom line of the fund balance, it takes time because we don't earn that money immediately. The way the contracts work is, we get that money as people live here year after year and as people pass away. It takes time for us to earn that. But it's one of the long-term ways that doesn't hurt the people who live here. Last year for the first time, or this year for the first time, we increased our street rate more than we increased the monthly service fees to residents. We're going to do that for the next couple of years, as long as the market allows it. So your rate doesn't go up more than 5%. If somebody who moves in tomorrow or next year or the next year, they're paying a higher monthly service fee than you are. Once they live here, their rate goes up by the 3.5%. So we're doing those things to increase our bottom line without putting it on the backs of the people that live here. Staffing, it'd be nice if we could just say, all right, let's cut staff by 10%. But that typically cuts service by 15% because people are going to be unhappy. What are we doing? We're really watching over time. We're looking at where we can save dollars without doing layoffs. We're looking at things we can do to become more effective with better technology. And again, we're going to continue to do that. We're not going to save tons of money on the salary side. Salaries continue to rise in the valley. 
Some of our fast food competitions are paying more than our CNAs are making, our security guards are making, and our maintenance guys are making, and even some of our supervisors are making. But we're going to continue to see that go up, but we're trying to control those costs as much as we can. Um, again, moving to that better technology so we can capture those dollars is important. Looking at waste is important. But we're, we're constantly looking at those things. The board is putting together a task force to figure out how to change that negative fund balance over time, over 10 years and 15 years. Not change it to nothing, but to start reducing that by a smaller percentage. When that negative fund balance only comes into play usually is if we're looking for a loan. So if Westminster Village is looking for a loan of $20, $30 million, it's just like your credit rating. It, you know, they, they're going to take into consideration if you're buying a house what your credit is, how much down payment you can make. And that's where that fund balance comes into play. But the reality is every light facility has the same thing, except for Royal Oaks. Royal Oaks doesn't have that problem because they've received hundreds of millions of dollars in donations over the last 45 years. So they've been able to uh, do things a little bit differently. They plan on a scale we don't. But all of our local competition of not-for-profits kind of sits in the same area we do. And that's good because when we talk to the bank, the bank's willing to give us twice as much debt as we have today. We don't want to take on that debt, but we have the capacity to because the bank thinks we're a great investment. The bank wants our business. The bank wants us to, to borrow more money. I think the quote from the vice president of the bank is, it's good business for us to loan you your own money. Uh, we have $15 million in the bank. If we wanted to take on another $15 million of debt, they're just going to charge us interest for our own money. So again, we're at a good risk. So financially, we're in good shape. And I'd say we're in great shape. I don't sleep uneasy. When we had $3 million in the bank, I'm so happy that Buffard was the CEO and I didn't have to figure out how we're going to make payroll two weeks from now. You know, I didn't have to figure out how we're going to make our debt service to the bank. So again, we're, we're in a really good financial position. Of all the things we need to worry about and I need to worry about, that's not one of them. Now, I do worry about it because, again, I want us to be in better shape. Because the better shape we're in, the better it is for you, the better it is for us. Uh, but we're in a good spot. One more thing about talking about you mentioned donations. Yep. Well, you mentioned donations of uh, Royal Oaks. And uh, I think that that would be something to, for the board of directors to, uh, to uh, work on. I understand that that's being done. But uh, talk a little bit about uh, donations and how they can uh, help us. And the second thing that goes along with that is the uh, gift program for the residents in order to keep them here. So donations, and again, so when we talk about our financial bottom line, there's three things, right? There's revenue that comes in, fees that you all pay, your insurance companies pay. There's uh, the expenses that go out, the cost of food, the cost of equipment, the, the building, the employees. And then there's the other one, which is donations. Donations have the ability to, to provide the, the biggest and quickest financial benefit to the campus. And they cause two different benefits. One is they make it a better place to live. So some donations come in and they're dedicated specifically for a capital project, the wire health care center, the, the swimming pool, some piece of equipment, a bus. And those, those come off of that financial benefit fairly quickly because it's amortized over, depreciated over a certain number of years. But we get the benefit of the product. Then there's the other donations. So one of the, I think, smartest things the board has done to help in the long-term financial position of Westminster Village is to create the endowment fund. So the endowment fund was created. There's $1.2 million in it right now. And that $1.2 million will stay in that endowment fund forever. And hopefully will be added to. So as we get donations that go to that endowment fund, those donations right away start to eat at that, that fund balance and 
move us towards long-term profitability. Because we don't take that and convert it into a service or a capital project immediately. In the long run, that does the best to help Westminster Village stay financially viable for the long term. So the creation of that endowment fund is amazing. So if you're making a donation to Westminster Village, and you're, it, I think it has to be more than $5,000, my recommendation to you is make it to the endowment fund. Because what will happen with that is it will continue to help Westminster Village for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. If you make a donation, and again, these are important, when you make a donation for a product or a service, the observatory, the jazz stuff, we get instant results on that, but it doesn't help the long-term financial status of the campus. So again, there's, there's two ways to look at it. Some people will look at the endowment fund as, well, I don't want to see the end results of my donation. You see the end results when you donate to the jazz concert. You see the end results if you donate to a park. It's built. It's there. Um, but if you want to donate to the long-term status and to the long-term health of keeping the resident assistance program in place, it's donate to the endowment. Because what happens there is the principal stays in that account, and any money that we make, so if we make 5% or 10%, 10% of that comes to help cover the expense of the resident services. Um, resident services, Westminster Village, we provide about $400,000 a year, $450,000 a year in resident assistance. Every year, and we've been doing that for a long time. And, and that means residents who lose their ability to pay part of their monthly service fee or all of their monthly service fee don't have to move out of Westminster Village. They continue living the life that they had the year before, five years before, ten years before. And it's, it's one of those incredible things that we're able to do on campus. It's one of those things that sets us apart from the for-profits. It's one of those things that makes your kids or your grandkids or your brothers, sisters, different people I've talked to, breathe easy. I meet with every one of those people that go on resident assistance. And I can tell you, not one of them wants to come in and have that conversation. Not one of them thought they would ever be there. They thought they saved long enough. People tell me when we have these conversations, I just never thought I'd live this long. They, they feel bad for living that long because they ran out of money and have to come in for assistance. Some of them are so proud they'd rather move out than, than come in and do that. We've had Medal of Honor winners in the healthcare center that ran out of money and their brother is saying, well, I'm gonna move my brother back to, I wanna say it was close long, but it could be Nebraska because he's too proud to live here for free. And we talked him into saying, most people never need that fund, but if you are one of those people that need it, it's an incredible relief to you and your kids. You don't have to go live in high housing for the last six months of your life or three years of your life. It's as good of a charitable purpose as any charity in this country. It, it's as good as keeping dogs alive and feeding the hungry. It's keeping people out of, off the street, at the end of their life, it's keeping people out of homeless facilities that could house other people. Again, we do a great job, and people who donate to that on the campus does a great job of providing that service. Okay. Any other questions? So we will, we will reschedule the financial one, and I'll have some graphs and stuff and handouts, because I do want you to see on paper we're in really good shape. Again, it doesn't mean we have all kinds of money and we can waste it. But we don't have to sleep on easy. We will be here 15 and 20 and 30 years from now. You can look at our line from start to finish and go, like I did, is I'm so happy to be the CEO here as opposed to here. It was scary over here. It was scary when we were down to two or three million dollars and going, we're, we're gonna need that. I hope, hope an entrance fee comes in. I hope something happens so we can make these payrolls. And again, luckily, other CEOs had to sweat those nights out. We can breathe a little bit easier. Again, we can talk about doing the healthcare center remodel and being able to afford to do that project. We can buy a new van. We, we can do those things and breathe a little bit easier. So it's a good, it's a good time to be a resident here. 
other than COVID. And it's a good time to be the CEO here, other than COVID. So thank you. Oh. One more question, sorry. Uh, are you still doing charitable donations? Since you mentioned donations. Yeah, so, so there's lots of ways you can give. And one of the things that the board did is they developed a development committee. So we're going to get all of that stuff out after the October board meeting. But yes, you can do a charitable gift annuity. That's something we do. It's, it's a way you can donate, but also see um, some money coming back to you. Um, we use stock options, so if you wanted to donate your, your, uh, some of your gains, you could do that. You can forward, if you're taking a, an IRA mandatory distribution, that could be donated to Westminster Village. There's lots of ways to donate. And every way is a great, you know, serves a great purpose. Just to follow up. I'll repeat the question. Uh, um, I'm talking about a charitable donation where you return to that person. Yeah, that's the, so you're talking about the charitable gift of doing. Yeah, yeah. So we, we do those. We don't do a lot of them, but it's up to residents or outside people who want to do them. So with, with that, we'll be doing a, a special kind of session just on that because Garth can explain it a lot better than I can. Okay, but I th think what I want people to understand, they do that in their lifetime, they get a return of interest depending on their age of 8% in an interest rate environment. Or so so it depends on the going interest rate, so it's a lot less right now because interest rates are pretty slim. Um, but the way the charitable gift annuities work is, yes, you make a donation. Half of that is considered a donation immediately. Half of that comes back over your lifetime in the form of a annuity payment. And again, we will we will be talking about that towards the end of the year. It is one of those good ways to give. Others give kind of those legacy gifts. Um, some people feel, I can't make a donation because I don't want to run out of money. So they do a legacy gift at the end of life. Lots of ways, and again, our organization, we will do a better way of talking about that after the October meeting. Thank you.